and what we're going to work on today is trying to get through um, the main important points for most of the rest of, of chapter 12. We've sort of been bogged down in this terminology of solid angles, emissive powers, spectra, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but now we're going to finally start to see where all those different things play in. So um, we talked about before this idea of emissive intensity, right? We said that there's this uh, this term I lambda e, right? Which was the power radiated in a particular direction per unit solid angle per, ang uh, per area of the emitter at a specific wavelength. So this is sort of like a, the w a description of the way that the power was concentrated as it goes out. Um, there's also such a thing as irradiation intensity. So this is emission intensity, and we talked about this in detail in the last lecture. Um, there's also irradiation intensity, which similarly describes the way that incoming radiation can vary with direction and wavelength. Okay. So um, if, if, if to make this more intuitive, consider walking outside on a blazing hot day, right? The amount of incoming radiation, you know, your, the irradiation upon you is not uniform, right? It tends to be concentrated in the direction of the sun, right? So that irradiation field has a spike wherever the position of the sun is. Um, moreover, right, that radiation isn't, in t is not, or that irradiation is not uniform over the entire range of wavelengths. If it was, sunscreen wouldn't do much good. As it stands, like sunscreen or sunglasses, right, they're able to filter out just a portion of that spectrum, namely ultraviolet wavelengths, and the rest of it doesn't have enough power to fry you. That's sort of the, the idea. And so that incoming radiation, we know it's concentrated in the direction of the sun, and it's concentrated around those harmful U, U, uh, UV wavelengths. So right there is your, your sort of evidence that, that that G term, right, the irradiation, all the incident radiation can vary with both of those parameters. Um, so this is the irradiation intensity variation of irradiation or G with direction and wavelength. And so this would be a written as a function I <coughs> lambda I of lambda and then our two spherical angles that tell us what direction we're looking at. Okay. Um, if we want to know our spectral irradiation We can integrate this, again, over that entire hemisphere, so 0 to 2 pi, 0 to pi over 2 of i, lambda i, theta, oops, lambda, theta, phi, sine theta, cosine theta, d theta, d phi, and now this will be in watts per meter squared micron, and this is the spectral irradiation. So now, right, we've taken away that this represents the amount of radiation per wavelength, okay? So that's a function over the wavelength only, but it accounts for the radiation coming in from all directions. And then finally, if we want the total irradiation, we can integrate this spectral irradiation over all wavelengths, so zero to infinity, lambda, lambda, 
phi lambda, and now we'll get watts per meter squared. So our familiar our familiar uh, flux. Yeah. So we've talked about E, you know, the emissivity went through a process like this. We've talked about irradiation went through a process here. Okay. And uh, we had two other, right, different versions of uh, two different important flux terms. There was this thing called radiosity and there's the net radiative heat flux. Um, radiosity, remember, is just the emissivity, the, that E term, or the, sorry, the emissive power, E, uh, plus the reflected portion of G. Okay, so it was all of the outgoing radiation, the actively emitted stuff, plus whatever isn't absorbed by an object. Um, and so that has a similar process. So um, radiosity has a similar set of terms um, and we'll just we'll we'll leave this simplified we'll say for an opaque surface j is the radiosity which is equal to e plus um, the reflected portion of g would be zero to the integral over all wavelengths. This is integral across the entire hemisphere of solid angles of I lambda E plus R. Okay, that is the emission plus the reflection. Um, and that's an intensity field again. So um, as, as much of a pain, let me finish writing this. Theta. So as much of a pain as um, all of these different I's, the E sub lambdas and stuff, as much of a pain as they are, they all have the same kind of, there's a pattern here. I is always the directional dependence and wavelength dependence. If you integrate out the wavelength dependence, then you end up with just directional dependence. If you integrate out just the directional dependence, you have just wavelength dependence. So it's, it's, it, 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 it's, uh, there's a common theme throughout all of these different flux terms. Um, and in almost all of the cases we're considering, right? I mentioned this last time, we're going to be focused on what are known as diffuse surfaces, those where we don't care about the directional dependence anymore, which means that, okay, these inner, um, these, this, this, these inner two integrals sort of become trivial. Basically, we're saying that across all of our spherical angles, um, the radiation intensity is uniform. Same with the irradiation intensity. Um, so the incoming radiation, we will also generally assume to be diffuse. That is, it, that, it, that, it, that it approaches uniformly from all directions. This, as I said, is not true when we're talking about things like radiation from the sun. But... For engineering approximations and for the purposes of this class, it's a fair assumption. Um, and so if we have diffuse emission, diffuse irradiation, and then if we assume that all of the reflected energy coming off an object through this reflected irradiation term, if we assume that's also coming off diffusively, then we can assume that that radiosity, okay, this J, is also a diffuse term. Um, which makes our lives much, much easier. Um, how are we doing on time? All right. Okay. Um, quick, quick poll. Uh, how many of you are? Well, let's start. Let's let's say how many of you are feeling? You know, ninety percent confident with the, the, the ideas of what a, like a diffuse surface is and the differences between intensity and spectral power. Okay, got small. Many of you are more like 50%. Okay. I'll take 
few minutes here to if, if any of you have any like if any of you know what your questions about this are ask them now if you're just kind of generally confused the best advice I can give you is to look over the notes and look at that glossary at the end of chapter 12 and yeah, that's going to be your best bet for solidifying this understanding um, but if you've got some specific questions about you know what's the difference between this term and this term the floor is open Maybe I'll try to maybe I'll try to prompt some questions. I don't have this in my notes, so um, I'll be kind of winging it here because uh, this is sort of a we're, we're transitioning topics now. So let's let's do a quick kind of recap, hindsight, you know, um, retrospective on what terms are actually important to us. Okay, um, so we have a diffuse. Oops. Diffuse emission and irradiation. Okay. Um, I said before, diffuse means it has no directional bias. Okay. So whether it's outgoing or incoming radiation, it's going to be uniform in all directions. It's known as isotropic. Okay. Good on this. All right. So, if we didn't have diffuse emitters, we'd have to worry about right intensity. So we'd have um, emission or irradiation or in some cases radiosity intensity which would be written as i lambda and then e, you know e or um, i or uh, i plus sorry e plus r um, so the, the the term here the intensity that, that we kind of the i means that this, we'll use an example of an emitter. If we have an emitting point right here, if we don't assume that this is diff a diffuse emitter, then what we could do is we could say, all right, it's emitting more strongly in this direction. Okay. And so that direction is going to be in spherical coordinates uh, described by some set of spherical angles, right? <coughs> theta and phi. Theta and phi and wavelength. And so we could say that, you know, kind of the, the, the concentration of radiation headed in this direction and at some particular wavelength is described by this intensity. So um, understand that this describes the dependence on both the, the frequency or wavelength of the emitted radiation and in the direction in which it's going or coming from. And so for the diffuse emitter or diffuse irradiation, the idea is that this, rather than having this weird kind of egg-shaped envelope that says there's more power headed in that direction, all of these vectors here will be identical lengths, saying that they have no particular bias. They're going in the same, every direction with the same kind of concentration. Spectral anything, okay? If it's spectral irradiation, spectral emission, spectral intensity, what have you. The idea with a spectral term is that this tells you how much of that thing is going on per, or for, as a function of wavelength. So um, let's say we're interested in figuring out, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll show you this figure in just a second. 
um, the spectral emissive power, okay, E sub lambda, um, will have units of watts per meter squared um, micron, and wavelengths will have wavelengths will have units of micron. Um, for example, the spectral emissive power of the sun, okay, looks something like this, where um, the this is about the band of visible wavelengths. Okay, so what this is saying is that at any particular wavelength, um, one wavelength doesn't itself have very much power. It's telling us at a particular wavelength, this value tells us how much, how many watts per meter squared of the sun, right? Meter squared of the sun, the projected area of the sun. How many watts per meter squared are being cast out um, for a small, like for, for a group of, of uh, emissions in that wavelength band? Um, and so if we wanted to figure out the total amount of radiated power coming out of the sun, we'd have to integrate the area under this curve. Okay. And so integrating the area under this curve gives us the emissive power. And so if we hit, whether we're talking about emission, irradiation, or radiosity, the idea is that this is now going to tell us the total radiation content or irradiation content of that ingoing, outgoing or incoming um, energy across all the wavelengths and accounting for all of the possible directions it could be going or coming from. So it's different combinations of these terms, right? Spectral intensity um, and, and uh, power. These are the different combinations here that we need to learn how to put together and be comfortable with. Um, the most common things that we're going to be working with, okay, we're not going to do very much um, with this idea of like an intensity field that varies with direction. Because generally, we're going to be assuming things are diffuse. Okay? And if things are diffuse, then it's a very simple um, relationship. We just take this number. We say it's no longer a function of these two, oh, sorry, of these two variables. And so when we integrate it over the entire visible space, or a solid angle of two pi steradians, which is a hemisphere, uh, then that just becomes multiplying this by pi. And it becomes our spectral whatever. Okay, so then we only have a dependence on wavelength. So we might we're going to be working with spectral, into spectral um, emissivity and spectral irradiation, and we'll be working with emissive power and irradiated power. Okay, so understand where the diffuse thing is. Understand the difference between the spectral quantity and the integral of that spectral quantity. Um. We'll get a little bit more practice with this in the next 15 minutes because we need to move on to uh, the, the specifics of this thing we refer to as black body radiation. Okay. We talked about black bodies early on in chapter one. Right? We said a couple of things. That a black body is a perfect emitter and receiver. Okay, that it's the, the, the platonic ideal of a emitter or receiver. It's mathematically the best that something can possibly be in radiation. Um, we're going to tighten up that notion a little bit with some extra definitions. So black body radiation. Um, cool. The best way to describe black body is through a couple of characteristic things. As I said, um, characteristic one is that a black body absorbs all incoming or incident, I should say, radiation. Okay. In other words, this means that its absorptivity is one. 
Okay, so 100% of that G term gets swallowed up by the black body and none gets reflected. Characteristic two. Black bodies are perfect emitters. In other words, no surface can emit more energy at a given temperature than can a black body. Three, black bodies are diffuse emitters. Four, radiation from a, we'll go ahead and just call these BBs for black bodies, save ourselves some um, hand cramping, uh, is wavelength dependent. Okay, so this gives rise to the idea of a E lambda B spectral emissive power for a black body. Um, and then sort of 4A here. The spectral emissive power is a function of temperature. Okay, so we, we're pretty happy with one, two, and three, I hope. These, these, we understand the implications of these three terms. Um, four and four A, okay. These are sort of embodied by this thing that's called the Planck distribution. So Max Planck, um, through a lot of mathematical wizardry, um, generated the Planck distribution, describes this spectral emissive power of a black body through the following equation. E lambda b is equal to, which is a function of wavelength and temperature, equal to C1 over lambda to the fifth times the exponential C2 divided by lambda t minus one where C1 is equal to 3.742 times 10 to the eighth watts micron to the fourth per meter squared and C2 is 1.439 times 10 to the uh, positive fourth yes micron Kelvin. Okay. So knowing C1 and C2 are constants, the idea is we can see immediately that right our only kind of free variables in here are lambda and t. So fine, we can believe this is a function of lambda and t. T being temperature in Kelvin. Okay. And if we plot this out, if we actually drew a, a drew a diagram of this, the idea is it would be a, a three-dimensional surface, right? Um, or we could draw it as a set of level curves. So let's say we pick a temperature and we plot, or we, and we were to draw um, this as a function of just lambda at fixed temperature. What that's doing is it's describing the spectral emissive power of an object that is a black body at that temperature. And so rather than draw these by hand, I've got, um, I pulled up an example of what these spectral emissive powers look like. Uh, so this is from the book. I forget what figure it is, but it's in um, section 12.4. Uh, 
So here we've got wavelength. Here we've got the spectral emissive power, E lambda B. Okay. And each of these curves is for a black body at a different temperature. So, you know, uh, 300 Kelvin, that is something that's right around room temperature. If we have a black body at room temperature, we can see that most of our spectral emissions are concentrated around wavelengths of 10 or so microns. But on the other hand, let's look at, for example, the sun. So solar radiation, you can see is ticked up there. Uh, the sun is at a, has a surface temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin. And um, see right here that the peak um, of our uh, right, the peak of our our solar radiation um, spectrum is right there, lying right across the band of visible um, wavelengths, which is one of the reasons that the sun looks so dang bright. Um, and this makes sense also because it's right. This sort of tells us why the sun appears the color it does as well. If most, if a lot of its spectral energy is being transmitted via visible wavelengths, and those visible wavelengths. Um, or, or in the intensity of those visible wavelengths, or the, the spectra, is fairly flat across the visible um, band here. Right? Then that means we're seeing a lot of spectral um, content all the way from ultraviolet to infrared. Okay? So it's, it's sort of almost uniformly bombarding us with all of the different visible wavelengths. And when you combine all the visible wavelengths, you get what? White light, right? And in general, the sun is, if you're not looking at it through a filter and sunglasses, it's pretty much white. Right? It doesn't have a distinct color. Um, so a couple of, uh, but a couple of um, observations here. This is, this is universal to black bodies, not just the sun. Um, and so a few conclusions here. We see that as the temperature increases, two, thing ha two things happen. Um, the Radiation at every single wavelength increases. Okay, so increasing the temperature always increases the amount of radiation for a particular wavelength. Okay, radiation gets more intense with temperature across the board. Also, the the peak of this spectral radiation um, moves down the wavelength axis. In other words, the wavelengths um, at which the peak radiation occurs get uh, Shorter and shorter and shorter. So um, as you heat something up further and further and further, right, that black body radiation goes from peaking somewhere in the radio frequency band, you know, screwing with your Wi-Fi, to gamma rays at really high temperatures, really tiny wavelengths. Um, and so that peak radiation, right, is described by this equation right here, which says that lambda max, that is that maximum wavelength, times temperature is equal to a constant, 2898 micron Kelvin. So if we know the temperature, we can figure out what the maximum wavelength is, or the wavelength for the maximum radiation um, is simply from that expression. OK. What if we wanted to know, so this is, as I said, this is the spectral um, this is the spectral emission. If I say I've got a wavelength of one micron, I'm concerned with. At one micron, can I tell? Can 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 I look at this graph and tell exactly how much um, power the sun is spitting out at a wavelength of exactly one micron? I guess hands up for yes. Hands up for no. Hands up for this is not a reasonable question. Um, okay. Well, this is this is kind of tying back to what I was saying earlier. If we say one micron, right? Here's here's our here's our x position. Um, we can go up. We we pick out a number um, off of that graph. So at one micron, we're talking about. Oops. So this is probably right around, um, oh, I don't know, 5 times 10 to the 
seven watts per meter squared per micron. Okay. So the important thing to notice here is that this is not a spectral, this is not a, a, a flux. This is not a radiation flux. It doesn't tell us how much actual energy is leaving per unit area because um, at exactly one wavelength, that one wavelength itself does not carry, um, does not carry, uh, it's a, it's in, in other words, this is such a, a, this is an infinitesimal slice and that little slice doesn't give us any area under the curve. Um, probability and statistics, right? Same idea with like, for probability distribution functions, what is the probability of exactly one value occurring? Zero. Okay. The way you get a probability of an occurrence from a PDF is integrating a finite band, re region underneath that probability distribution function. You've taken stat statistics at this point, right? Um, all right. So if we wanted to know how much power is being thrown out by the sun, the idea is we have to specify a band of frequencies and we have to integrate the area under the curve. So what we would do is we'd say, maybe we're interested in knowing the, uh, the power being cast out by the sun at this band of frequencies, we would simply integrate the area under the curve. Okay. Or, and so that would give us, you know, that would give us a, a, a quantity that's in watts per meter squared. Um, or if we wanted to know the total emissive power of, you know, one of these curves, let's say we have a black body at 300 Kelvin and we want to know the total emissive power across all wavelengths and that just turns into integrating the area under this entire curve. Okay, and that's going to give us E rather than E sub lambda. So, um, oops. Okay. So, integrate area under curve, and what comes out the other end is going to be. Emissive power EB. Okay, and I think that uses up pretty much all the time we've got for today. Um, what we're going to talk about is how, right, this idea of a black body uh, is sort of the basis for talking about real surfaces. So everything else is based on its comparison with a black body, and we'll talk about that on Friday. Final homework has been posted, so look on ICON for that. That will be due on the last day of class by close of business, uploaded to ICON.